this is David Ellis once again with Amir Jahangiri and Andrew Botsis. And for those of you who are out there, y'all might be noticing something strange going out in going on in the world around you. Um, if you're particularly attuned, we most likely are going to be discussing this today. But today we want to discuss spirituality in everyday life. So a lot of you have a bunch of rituals and practices that you do, and you have no idea that they have some spiritual significance. And we are here today to make you more conscious of these facts. Okay? So for those of you who um, go through life arbitrarily, this will be quite an education. And so um, I'm going to let my co-host Amir and Andrew speak on this topic. Go ahead, guys. So the first thing I want to say, let's use a metaphor. An atheist who does not believe in the spiritual idol whatsoever. There comes a fine line where even atheism is its own belief. Spirituality is nothing but belief. So even atheists have rituals of repetitivity that have nothing to do with science, nor skeptics. They don't know why they do it. And oftentimes people in everyday life don't realize why they do it. Mm -hmm. It's a, in the metaphor of atheism, when we have a inspiration, one who is spiritual says it comes from the divine, one who is atheist, it comes from within. And yet there's a whole group of spiritual people who say it's all within. Mm. So no matter what your belief is, there is a realm beyond what you've heard, read, or studied that makes up the totality of you who knows more than you've heard, read, or studied. Well, um, ladies and gentlemen, my warmest greetings. Again, I'm very grateful for you being here. Thank you for your time. Well, this topic is very practical and very beneficial. There's a lot of stuff uh, that can be considered magical. Again, science that is too far advanced can be misconstrued as magic. But let's just focus on the practicality of these topics. Uh, that which can be used towards your good, that which can benefit you. Mm -hmm. Now, you don't need to completely understand fully the mechanics, the dynamics, the structure, the design, and the science behind everything for you to be able to use it and benefit from it. So if there's a certain practice, certain phenomena, technique that can be used and viewed in this way, something that although the entirety of it is unknown to us at this time, it can benefit you. So let's focus on these different forms that can be uh, seen in everyday life, repetitive practice. And again, Andrew mentioned repetition. That does come into it. Mm. Repetition and dedication for anything to actually, like a seed, to sprout, to grow, to have a, a trunk and branches and ultimately fruit. There's a process involved. So let's have a look and see what comes up today. Thank you. Yes, so before we move on, I just want to um, put a word out there. First of all, I want to put a plug in for Andrew's book. If you haven't gotten it already, The Galactic Historian, please get this book. This book is something that you guys absolutely should read. Um, the other aspect, um, I want to also mention um, um, The Mother of everybody esoteric in the area where I live, Donna Kruger, thank you so much for the psychic surgery you did on me yesterday. That was extremely painful, but it worked. Um, so we shall move da on. Da da David accidentally touched a porcupine. <laughs> they had to have some barbs removed. <laughs> right. And so, and so today, <laughs> what we're gonna be doing is going through the re regular practices that people have. Okay, so let's talk about the concept of praying, right? Let's talk about this concept of praying. What is it about prayer that makes a difference? Because honestly, for me, um, prayer is nothing more than an incantation, okay, to the universe. Now, you, it doesn't matter what you refer to the universe as, whether you say God, whether you say um Allah, um, Yahweh, or what, it doesn't really matter. The incantation or that communication or the setup is necessary, and you are the ma magician. So how is prayer different from theurgy, which is um, basically God magic? How is it different? 
Uh, anybody want to um, jump in here? I got it. Prayer is a process of finding strength, wisdom, knowing this from the internal, eternal being you know you are. Many of you have known you more than you heard, read, or studied. Prayer is very similar to we learn to know ourselves. Prayer is the way we make higher frequency friendships with the universal source working through us all. Prayer doesn't need a religion or an esoteric system. Prayer can be no words or thousands of words. Prayer is a form of gratitude and love expressed to the divine co-creative self manifesting this life walk that has known and unknown factors. Prayer is the process of making the unknown known by showing us how to get rid of fear and any other process that limits our ability to believe in our own self. Prayer is finding the integrity of heart space truth and emanating unconditional love in the expression of vibratory words to convey the essence of the I am to all that there is, was, and ever will be. Thank you. Thank you. And I hope you guys receive that, right? So the simple act of prayer establish a communication, establishes a communication system between yourself, the divine self, and all that there was and ever will be. Okay, so what is it about prayer that works for people? Because the truth of the matter is that you don't have to be particularly spiritually gifted, right? But just the action of prayer. I mean, we made this um, we made this point on one of our shows. A little girl that kneels down by the side of the bed and says, "Now I pray. Now I am um, me down to sleep. I pray the Lord my soul to keep." and prays for her mommy and daddy to be okay. Is that less powerful than you going into a church and doing your prayers? That little girl might actually um, have something that going for her that you may not have going for her. It may be repetition and genuine intent. Absolutely. So again, it's all using the infinite being we are to create and manifest reality in alignment with our will. And so that may take many, many different forms. It could be in uh, intonations, music, poetry, in words spoken with emotion and intent. It could be in drawings and paintings. It could be in creating sigils of power, uh, writing a novel, writing a book. It could be in just thinking of a tone in your mind. Mm -hmm. So it, there are many, many ways to encapsulate this intent and release it to the intelligent, conscious cosmos mm -hmm. for it to then bow down. Yes, mighty creator being, I hear and I obey. And therefore, these have to be pure. The intention must be clear. The emotion and thought must be aligned. And if that is the case, there are many forms into, in which we can encapsulate and send to the universe this intention and will, and the result can be the same. So it's just as powerful if you do it in silence, in intimacy with the divine, or within countless uh, fellow uh, worshippers in a crowded church or mosque or synagogue or temple. Uh, again, I, I, I'm, my understanding is it is the purity, clarity, and alignment of all aspects of the being towards that single purpose that makes it potent and powerful. If you've got internal doubt, one part of you is pulling this way, one the other, it's going to subtract from the whole. So, yes, the, 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 the person praying, keep my mommy and daddy safe, that's incredibly powerful because it's pure. Mm -hmm. So let's talk about the use of mantra. Real quick, prayer and any other everyday process is conscious application of the sacred. The implementation of conscious application of the sacred is the equation to understand why repetition of prayer functions in our reality and has a continuing function. Mm -hmm. When we implement our, our willpower and we are consciously applying that willpower, we will have results in our conscious mind. And that's really what it takes in terms of the manifestation, the last plug in the manifestation system, seeing it. Um, so I want to talk about the use of mantra. 
Right. So if you mm -hmm. are a meditator, one of the easiest ways to access um, trans states is through the repetition of the sacred words, right? The sacred sounds, the sound and um, vibration. So that word is broken down into two words, man meaning mind and tra to float or be free. And so what we want to talk about right now is why did mantra come about as a system of meditation as opposed to a system of, how should I say, invocation? Dogma. Yeah. It was a recognition of the cognitive recognition of the now. The, the emotional resonance of the now and the cognitive resonance of the now, because that resonance has tone. And in that now moment, you reach the unlimited, unlimited point of view. Expansion through tone and tonality. And the, the funny thing about it is that it's easy to access for anyone. Anyone. You read, mm -hmm. write. Or, 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 or you, you don't even need to, let's say that you, you learn a mantra and you went deaf. Having that sound, it has become part of you. Mm -hmm. Your meditation is still accessible. It's still and, an ephemeral, an ephemeral moment that remains as a memory. Agreed. Uh, I, I would like to look at the mantras as the seed with infinite potentiality, mm. a seed that is a fractal, that with repetition and conscious energy, it starts spiraling and growing in scale, yet the whole thing looks the same, but yet as it manifests and grows, it becomes powerful. So the first time you hear the mantra and understand it, that seed is, so to speak, planted within your being. Now it is up to you to cherish it, nourish it, give it energy and sustenance to make it grow and flow to the full potential. And the end result is absolutely the same in everyone. So it's really high spiritual technology, the ability to condense the infinite into a seed. And that is so beautiful. It's like the way life works. Life starting from a single cell, it seems the universe follows these laws. Mm -hmm. This is the way reality is laid out. And so it's one of those techniques, one of those technologies that if you just sustain, if you nourish, if you love and let it grow, the end result is um, beautiful. It helps unfold the infinity that you are, so to speak, in other words, looking from the top down instead of down up. It's removing barriers of amnesia, doubt, fear, yes. limitation that I cannot, I am not, it is not possible. Just to help you realize the truth, which is you are infinite, it is all here now, there is no I cannot do. So mantras, uh, again, with that repetition, you see, uh, I mean, the, the Buddhists, monks, they do this for years, the same mantra over and over. And again, I'd like to uh, kindly draw the attention of our esteemed audience to a very simple tool, the mala beads. Now, these have been around for forever. And you don't, you just, it's just for keeping scale, proportion. So you do a certain number of one mantra, you move to the next. If you want to count, it's going to ruin the whole thing. You're adding numbers into it. That's not the intention. So you move one by one doing the mantra over and over, that repetition over time is powerful, my friends. And, and it's also be, useful, that, that's a Rudrak Mala, if I'm not mistaken. Yes. yes. <laughs> ah, look, it's so been a while else, since yeah. a Rudrak Mala. So something else about mantras, it's a way to immediately to eliminate the hierarchy of the, of the religious caste systems. Yes. And when there's no more hierarchy, that means there's no more lowerarchy. It is your job to use those mantras for your purpose, your implementation of your sacred expression of self-discovery. And I, I, and I want to put something in here as well. For those of you who are having trouble using mantras as a way of ac accessing the divine, I want to say something here. Um, for anybody who's taught any class on magic, we know that the words that you utter you could utter them one of two ways. Let's say I have a, a mantra, let's say um, my, I say something like, uh, 
baseball bat, baseball bat, baseball bat. It is different than when I actually let the baseball bat in. It is different than when I actually let it in. And so when you guys are doing invocations and your rituals and stuff like that, don't just say things by rote. A lot of y'all take pride in learning spells in ancient arcade languages. It doesn't matter what language it comes in, it's how your body receives and expresses th those words. And that is something that um, um, has to be taught in a lot of magical schools, which it isn't um, being taught in right now. Um, so I suppose our next topic is the concept of movement, dancing. <laughs> That's an interesting one. That's an interesting one. <laughs> dancing has been a part of the spiritual evolution since the dawn of spiritual evolution. Since the very first ignorant tribe came out of ignorance and said, hey, let's stretch some hides over a piece of wood and make a drum. And then all the different tribes said, hey, your tones and my tones, this very common perception there. And my God, your feet dance like my feet. Vibration, tone, innocence, no longer in ignorance, and the discovery that motion and vibration are syncopation of the spiritual worlds. Very much so. Yes, 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 indeed. So when including movement and dance, rhythmic movement, intentional movement, or it could be free form, if that's not the important detail of it. The importance is, as, as David mentioned, letting it in, or so to speak, letting it out, letting that flow take over, that the process is no longer forced by the conscious mind. There's a flow going, like a gentle stream moving through all your being. And this can become immensely powerful. Mm -hmm. So we see effects of this in um, Tai Chi or Qigong. Mm -hmm. Very, very simple movements. If you just stick with these for a certain amount of time, you can feel the energy of your being amplified. The big again, answers. Yes, 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 absolutely. So again, with the expression of that will, uh, that could be connection to the divine, unrestricted. Mm -hmm. That dance around the fire where you move and you just let it go. That mm, your entire being is involved and you're taking advantage of your physical limbs, this uh, beautiful skin suit that we, that we have, and, and uh, every single other aspect. The conscious mind in that state goes into a trance. You give it a break, take a nap, uh, little uh, monkey brain. Mm -hmm. Let the bigger boys have the party now. You, you're invited also, but let, let the bigger, larger aspects take over. I think that dancing has a lot of um, significance because honestly, there's not a lot of dancing going on in Buddhist monasteries. Um, maybe we should have a rave there one day. Okay, no. There's not, there's not, there's not, like, quite a, it would be an awfully there. quiet rave. It would be an awfully quiet rave. Very respectful, very zen. <laughs> very respectful, right? right? So, what, um, what we, I think that when people think about dancing as an access form, people, there are some religions and some sects that um, discourage the use of that because it, it feels uncontrolled or whatever else. And possibly that might be what we need more of. Okay. Right. That's possibly what we might need more of, not less, okay? And so I tend to think of it as dancing the others, taking the elements in, right? Letting it out. It's as natural as breathing is, right? Now, the American Indians knew this. Um, people from Africa knew this. People from India knew this, okay? And I think it's, it's not a good trend to say that, oh, dancing, not so much. I think we probably need to get back to those very uh, basic and primal practices because it produced, apart from the fact that it's healthy, it's a healthy expression and it's a release, right? It stops energy from being stuck. Yes, just shakes everything up and it allows it to be released. And I would really love to go back to 
what David said earlier about how these mantras or um, um, magical texts in any language would work, something that's not being taught in many schools, mystery schools and so on, or you can't immediately pick up in a book that you read. Mm -hmm. It has to, the mantra has to repeat, be repeated so much that it becomes completely natural in a way that the conscious mind can then let go. Mm -hmm. your, 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 your system takes over, you're saying the mantra over and over, you, you go through a full round of the mala without even knowing what's done. So that's where it becomes powerful. The state that you reach when it can become, okay, I release, I let go, I surrender to the flow. And in dance, that's easy. The body knows how to take over. Mm -hmm. But with mantras and words or, or, or uh, magical texts, the repetition comes in. There is something in dance as well. Have you ever gone to a dance recital where the moves have been practiced by a bunch of people? You can tell the people who are doing the moves from the people who are feeling the moves. Yes. Yes, okay. yes. Same thing goes to spirituality. When you have a weekend warrior that comes up to a group of people who practice every day, they have no idea we see them like that. You're just executing a learn move, like putting Lego blocks together. Yes, and these are for the spiritual purists. So with, with that spiritual narcissism, right? So, and you have to feel, you have to feel in jest. Be part of, it has to be part of your DNA. Um, yeah. which would actually bring us to the next topic at hand. Can I just add some tiny little thing to, to the sure, subject? Absolutely. But it reminds me of a live performance of the flamenco dance I had the pleasure of seeing in Spain. Oh. Now, the instruments were all old, not very expensive, clothes were shabby, stage was filthy. But, oh my goodness, you should have seen this lady dance with such passion. She had a little uh, thing in her hair. And as she was spinning, this thing flew out with such speed. Everybody was in the energy. You can't fake that kind of thing. So yeah. somebody who feels it, rather than going to a symphonic orchestra, somebody plays like a goddamn jukebox, no feeling. Technically perfect but yet no emotion, none of that heart inside. So uh, again, you can't fake this kind of thing. And that comes with heart. I'd like to insert into this part of our conversation. Without the heart, you might as well forget about it uh, or, or go down the path of the dark side. Yeah, you need heart for this kind of thing. Agreed, which brings us to the next topic at hand and we've discussed it in a, in a past episode, the mudras. <laughs> middle finger our, our, our middle Sorry. finger <laughs> the mudras okay so the significance of the mudras in everyday life let's talk about some mudras that we, we've seen are they spiritual in nature like talk to the hand if, right. if I may uh, jump in here the, the mudras are so I, I've done a good number of years, better part of a decade on the brain and movement and speech and so on. So half of the motor cortex is controlling the face, uh, vocal cords and the muscles that control speech. 25% is the hands, right? And the 25% remaining is all the rest of the body. So if you associate a mantra, which is speech with mudras, so you've got different hand seals, different things that come in, right? These all take over. Then you've got 75% of the brain consciously focused on one thing. The rest easily follows. And they are very, very practical. Is it just spiritual? I don't believe so. It's a very practical ancient science of taking the body and the mind into certain desired zones. So an example of this is the Kujiin, the Kujikiri, the spiritual aspect of ninjutsu. And again, these uh, elite warriors use this spiritual uh, technique because it enhanced the entire being from the body to their intuition, knowing that somebody is just about to shoot an arrow at you before it's even done. And even today in the modern times, 
I've, I've come into knowing that uh, the Israeli special forces are now using the same mudras, taking the wubu out of it, saying, okay, for example, if you do this gesture, whenever you want to apologize and make peace, it reduces your blood pressure, reduces your heart rate, puts you into a calm state where you can take control, not be overwhelmed by the adrenaline that you get that, that naturally becomes pumped into the bloodstream in a uh, stressful situation. So they teach their elite soldiers, okay, there's gunfire going everywhere, you just do this certain meditation. You don't have to even do this, you can ha have your, your hand on the firearm. And it works. That's why they use it. And of course, you know, they're very practical, um, uh, very open-minded people. So again, it continues to have its useful, beneficial um, implementation in many aspects of life. So it's not just spiritual, it's a very real thing. And in order to make it work, you need to repeat it over and over, like this gesture that will reduce the blood pressure and lower your heart rate, bring you into a state of Zen and control. So yeah, it's not just woo-woo, it's not just spiritual. Very, very scientific, very, very practical. So mudra is an understanding like the body language specialists of today mm -hmm. have understood how to create the hack, just as what Amir was saying. Now, in my perception, when you have a person using mudras and ritual dance, it's like having the crawler underneath them or somebody next to them doing sign language that's adding an entire layer of information that is understood through the motions, which then changes the actual words or songs that might be hearing through perception. How many times have you watched a, a thing where it's got the person doing sign language and the crawler at the bottom? There's a whole bunch of information coming at you. And when we learn how to have information hierarchy control systems, such as using mudras, to expand and express our different capacities, we understand how much body language is a part of the human resonance system. And resonance, meaning does this piece of body language match the expression of words? And if it does, there's a telepathic transmission transition of even more information, which can allow limited forms of the term grokking, where ideas are rapidly exchanged through simple actions, and then the words compound those actions. Yeah, so, I, I have a theory about mudra. I actually believe it's part of our evolutionary process, and I'll tell you why. If you look at apes and chimpanzees, their expressions and their hand signals and the way they communicate with each other, I think that is the root of mudra. This is our, or this is one kind of original um, communication system. So I do believe that what it is that we, we we create our modern mudras like talk to the hand mm -hmm. or the middle finger and so on mm -hmm. inside of us is an inbuilt understanding or that that, that fist thing mm -hmm. that says we must fight yes but and you tell you tell you tell an italian person to not talk with his hands and they can't do it yeah, you tell, an indian person, tell an indian person to not talk with their hands Stop, yeah, stop bobbing your head. <laughs> the worst is an Italian Indian. Okay, they can't do it. I also think I also think the domination of left-handed, right-handed choiceness that came around in the late 1800s, 1700s was a way to suppress it from Western culture. And Andrew, even worse is an Italian Indian doing the river dance, you know? Yeah, there <laughs> that's, you go. That's funny. Oh, that's funny. So, oh, so that's I, I just want to add a small um um, topic to this in, in, in um, agreement with what sure, the gentleman said, that it goes the, to the earlier stages of the evolution of our being. So for example, certain trauma is stored in the body, um, most notably in the vagus nerve, which will hit any combination of organs, all organs are connected to this, and there's certain gentle relaxation exercises with the neck, with the eyes, and so on, that releases this tension. Now, this is pre-linguistic, meaning that it would work on another primate or any other uh, living being, a map, 
mammal that has this vagus nerve. So being pre-linguistic, it has a higher power, higher, um, let's say, priority in healing stuff that just by doing therapy, just by doing, uh, let's say, cognitive behavioral therapy, different sort of counseling um, uh, sessions, you wouldn't reach that level of depth. With these gentle stretches and exercises, you're telling the body and this nerve specifically, ah, oh, let it all go. And it's so powerful. So again, these mudras unlock certain things in the body that are hundreds of millions of years old. They yeah. just work. Yeah, there's I a reason want- why, why gorillas could be taught sign language. It was natural to them. Yeah, it was, uh, uh, that's a communication system. And that's a big argument for evolution. And can I just say something um, to what Amir just said? Mudras, a lot of people understand what somatic experiencing is and somatic healing is, but nobody teaches how do you do it to yourself, <laughs> right? You, you, you don't have to depend on a practitioner if you understand and learn um, the mudras and so on, which will Absolutely. bring us to the next topic at hand. <laughs> mm. <laughs> the holy prostration, the stretches, the bends, the, the postures that we're talking about. So Hatha Yoga has a, um, a basic system of, oh, just about 908 postures and 840,000 exercises. But don't worry, everybody. If you don't finish the syllabus, you can come back and finish it in your next life. Okay, so that's, a, that's, not a, that's not a small system. It's not a small system. So, and I would know, I tried to finish the syllabus much to my frustration. So it will take a few years, but for our purposes and for this broadcast, the stretches, the way your body, um, the postures, and I don't mean postures as in you go and bend yourself into a pretzel. I mean the communication system with the body and the divine, the sun salutation, Surya Namaskar. Okay? Are these things... Um, in and of themselves spiritual because nowadays it's just a health thing. People reduce it to a health thing. Are they spiritual in nature? Because a sun salutation by name, Surya Namaskar, should theoretically point to a spiritual um, practice. But nowadays it's a Lululemon practice for commercial. So when it's down to it subconsciously, it's spiritual to them. But there are so many people that come into these Chi, chi, tai Chi, um, yoga, whatever it is, who don't apply the spiritual side, mm-hmm. but it's affecting their spiritual world. And just because they, they're like, there are many atheists that do half the yoga and don't give a crap about the spiritual inference to it, but are they still getting the benefits to it? Yes. Mm-hmm. Can they get more benefits out of allowing more of that into the reality? Yes. So when it comes down to it, it's still the application of conscious application of the sacred. What we do with that conscious application of the sacred will be your belief-based choice and systems. I completely agree. And again, with, with um, the effects of yoga or any spiritual, say, movement-based or, or voice-based or thought-based mm-hmm. practice that has repetition involved, one must consider this, that the different aspects of the being are not separate. It's all here now. So, of course, the beneficial effects are going to be there. Now, if the person, however, consciously knows what they're doing, for example, they know the meaning of the mantras, mm-hmm. or they know the significance, both spiritually and scientifically, of these different um movements or states of the body in yoga, that will just make it that much more powerful. If you're completely ignorant of these, you're still doing that beneficial act, it's going to have a positive effect. But just imagine, you know, I mentioned earlier that if all aspects of your being, including the conscious mind, are perfectly aligned, it makes it that much stronger. So if you don't know what you're doing, you still do the good thing, you're going to benefit. I I think that would be correct to assume. Yes, I I would also like to say a few things here, um, because um, Andrew made a very, very um, important and salient point there. With regard to the practices of Hatha Yoga and the practices of Tai Chi, if you come into that practice 
and you're experiencing the bends and the twists, what you are actually doing is not affecting the muscles. You're trying to affect the cells, the very atoms of your being, right? Why? Because you want to bring them into alignment. The word yoga, just so that we're clear, is a marriage or a union. It means togetherness. It means what my spirit does. A lot of people go do yoga as a health practice and then come home and meditate. No, you should have been meditating while you were doing <laughs> while you were doing the yoga. Okay. So um, these are the kinds of things. Mindfulness is very important here as a, as a topic, and so I think with regard to those bends and stretches that we're talking about and, and the, the practice of holy communion with the a physical body, um, it cannot be understated because honestly speaking, the left hand must know what the right hand is doing, right? And the two I've middle fingers have to know. The, the, the and left the hand must know what the right hand is doing. Right. And the two middle fingers are a part of the left hand and the right hand. Thank you. Right? So... That's basically what we want to say with regard to that. So, if, um, if, the, go ahead. If you, before, before you move on, I'd like to add something else that you mentioned, David, that you spend this incarnation from childhood up to this point trying to do all the yoga uh, techniques. Mm -hmm. And then if I may respectfully suggest that even if you now go back to step one, you've learned so much nuance, minutia, and detail on that very basic move, it just never ends. It keeps on expanding. Yeah. So with even the most simple, uh, simple um, states in yoga, there's, there's never a ceiling. It just keeps getting larger, larger, and more and this powerful. this is why the Vedic philosophy has no end. That's, they had to write that stuff down. Really, they did. Let me explain something to you. The thing about the Vedic philosophy is that you are going, this is not a weekend course. Hell no. Okay. Which is why a lot of people um, brought this thing down to a bunch of health practices. But let's go on the other side of the fence. The art of screaming and shouting. Yeah. Oh, yeah. What? You did the, the, the Haka dance. <laughs> Right. Has anyone ever seen how the haka dance is used in traditional societies in New Zealand? Mm -hmm. It is both an honor and a scaring attempt. There are specific moves that bring out a terrifying energy that can be felt. Recently, there was these uh, anti-vaccine mandates, uh, riots, not riots, got, um, uh, things that were going on and the government was trying to close down the capital so it couldn't show up. So what did the protesters do? They just sat there and did the haka dance in front of all these cops. 10,000 people doing a haka dance at 400 cops trying to stop them from protesting. Yes, very effective. Uh, shouting and screaming, um, not necessarily practices you want to do 24 hours a day, seven days a week, but it is a release in and of itself. Japanese... Mm -hmm. I come from Japanese systems, right? I have done the martial arts before. The simple art of saying kiai. Yeah. 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 Right? Yeah. Is in and of itself a spiritual practice, right? I wouldn't suggest you try to break any boards without kiai, okay? Because if you wanted to, to, to think of, Amir, you made a... a uh, reference to um, ninja magic, yes. Fujikiri. Yes. There is another aspect of ninja magic called Kobudera, okay, which is the dark art of uh, magic. And one of the practices that has stayed with Japanese philosophy from the samurai to the ninja, right, because they were always seen as op opposing sides of a um, force, so is the art of um, purposeful screaming. Do you know that they teach people to scream in Japanese business school? Do you want to know why Japanese are successful businessmen? They don't hold it in. They let it out and then they become focused. Okay? Excess energy, let it out, you become focused. That is part of their martial arts. That is part of their philosophy. That is their philosophy of warfare. Okay? Kamikaze pilots. 
in World War II understood this concept. So the art of shouting and screaming, not that I'm going to give you guys license to go shout and scream at everybody that you meet on the road and say, oh, this is totally healing. Andrew, Andrew David and the bear told, told us to scream at people, right? But there is an art of purposeful screaming that can de-stress you, release blockages in your spirit, and it is like a kind of a mantra in and of itself because it's a clearing, okay? American Indians used it in war. It's, it's, it's not, let's just look at an example of the everyday sneeze, the way the muscles contract in harmony to generate that velocity of air that would clear the sinuses, the lungs, the throat, and so on. Mm -hmm. Imagine that harmonized movement of all aspects of the being in releasing energy. So doing it naturally, the body knows how to do this, but doing it on demand with the conscious mind takes practice. So that perfect with movement, it, it just harmonizes everything. So if you're breaking a cinder block with the perfect kia, your entire being is harmonized in it. You're using your chi, you're using the strength and conditioned uh, limb. It just makes things that much sharper, like a blade that you've honed the edge to one atom thickness. It just makes it that much more effective. And again, you can't just go out randomly screaming at people, as David says. It takes practice. So you've got to scream at a lot of people to be able to do one proper scream. <laughs> and we have that in the American Indian tradition when they went mm -hmm. to war, right? Yeah. And they actually, they, they actually are the ones that actually hone that science down to a fine art, huh? Yeah. Every indigenous culture has an example. In the, Ma the Maori culture, when they came to your land to invade you, they got off the boats, did, did their haka, and you did their haka back. And everyone goes, eh, their haka was better. It's time to join you. It stopped wholesale murder. Now, when, when I'm talking about the protest, the anti-mandate protest, look up the Wellington protest anti-mandates perform haka in front of the parliament. Now, there is a limited amount of videos, but there's actually over 10,000 people doing the haka at the parliament building, releasing this energy. You can feel it. No matter how, how dense you are, when there's 10,000 people doing this mass expression, you can feel it. The Spartans of Greece? Oh, yes. 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 Yeah. The, uh, look, I think that screaming and shouting, and I wanted to do one last topic here, drumming, chanting. Yes. Mm -hmm. These practices all together, they're becoming less and less in the spiritual community. The spiritual community is no, no fun anymore, okay? Like, we, we need to have a spiritual jam session. I've already said so. I'm going to make that happen, yes. right? And so I, I want to put out a call to action to all musicians. Email me at info at universalcitizentv.com and uh, let's put together a spiritual jam session online, live. Let everybody with your spiritual instruments at home that are collecting dust on your wall jump in. And no flash flutes. <laughs> right? Your spiritual instruments, whether they be flutes, or so, jump in and let's see what can happen, raise the vibrations. So, drumming, um, chanting, and screaming put together. What does that do in terms of the NG signature of people? Does it harmonize the people? Does it harmonize energy? Yes. Does it just release energy or does it do both? I, I think it's it's it does all the above. Yes. It's, alchemy, it's alchemy and chemical action. Mm -hmm. So we talked about harmonizing uh, in an individual, harmonizing all aspects of the being mm -hmm. so that everything is aligned towards that single purpose. Now what these instruments do is harmonize the masses together. Not only the individual is perfectly aligned towards the objective, everybody is aligned perfectly together. That becomes incredibly powerful. So as you say, David, spiritual communities have become just no fun, really no fun. You go in, it's all dead and dull. 
Where's the drums? Where's the passion? Uh, where's that what? flamenco dance that makes your hair stand on the skin, give you goosebumps? Where's that gone? We need more of that passion. Um, I think that might be purposeful because we couldn't congregate for the last two years. I think that has had a permanent and um, I wouldn't say permanent. I'm going to re re reject, uh, re redress that. I, it has had a very damaging effect on communities, spiritual communities being um, part of that equation. But I believe these things are coming to an end right now. And we just wanted to remind you guys that everyday practices need to be followed, including the screaming, chanting, drumming, mantra, and things that make um, spiritual practice fun. You guys, I'm just going to um, let you guys have the last word here. Andrew, over to you. We choose to express ourselves. We have to let go of what I call perception deception filters. We deceive ourselves by saying no. We deceive ourselves by saying somebody else is better. We deceive, deceive, deceive. And when we're done deceiving ourselves, all that we have left is our truth. And you want your truth to be heard. Yell it proud, yell it strong. So um, I'd like to um, encourage the esteemed ladies and gentlemen listening to this to create a spiritual and then quote unquote magical daily practice of your own, something that is completely unique to you. It may be a certain drawing you've created, certain piece of text you've written, a poem, could be just a little melody that you, that you um, repeat in your mind, but associate with that intention, pure intention to truth, freedom, and being the infinite powerful being that you are, removing barriers. That deception filter that Andrew mentioned, that's very important. So chip at it a little bit at a, at a day. You know, there's an old movie, Escape from Alcatraz, uh, the famous prison where the guy just basically using a spoon digs a tunnel and escapes. Think of it in that kind of term, that with this little spoon that you've created, that magical, glorious spoon, you're digging away bit by bit at those barriers, those illusions, those deceptions. Create your own form. Let it flow. Put your heart in it and then do it over and over and over. Thank you guys so much. And guys, um, we did this, uh, this topic today because I think a lot of things are missing um, in our um, spiritual practice. For those of you who are having trouble making your A plus effort, what we just talked about today will make you reach that level, okay? Because it won't be seen as a chore. It will be seen as something I want to do, something I enjoy doing, right? Conscious, conscious application of the sacred that has the integrity inside it to remain yourself. Thank you so much, guys, for coming out. And I will see you guys later. Take care, guys.